the, the time on the program, so we'll go ahead and get started. And first off, just do an introduction. Uh, so I'm Will Acock, I'm the general manager of Greenlight Community Broadband in Wilson, North Carolina. I'm always going to be a shameless self-promotion North Carolina's first gigabit city. Have to get that in. Um, however, you may have heard that Salisbury is now announced in the 10 gig city, so it appears we're now in a bit of an arms race. Um, so we'll have to see what we can do to respond. Um, this is Donald Richardson here. Donald works with Greenlight. He's our head end and engineering and IT manager, so he actually runs all of that. So if you have technical questions, I'll probably go add in and look at Donald and he'll answer. Um, I do a lot of these presentations. I go all over the place and there's a standard slide deck here and I can go through and step you guys through the story of Wilson. That said, I'm really hoping we can turn this into more of a conversation, um, especially in the case, especially with the audience that we have here. I'd love to know what your questions are and I'd love to just be able to sit here and have a discussion and answer your questions. So certainly, can step through the slide deck um, and I'm happy to do so, but please interrupt me and you know to the extent that we can turn this into a discussion that would be something that I would appreciate uh, very much. So. Before we get into it, I do think there's some level setting stuff, um, sort of some overview of things that are not specific to Wilson that usually come up, so we'll start out with that. Um, you know, one of the things that people often want to know about is you know, what is the status of what you're doing with the FCC? What's the status of House Bill 129? What's the legal status of municipalities you know, being in this space right now? Um, and first of all, I'm not an attorney. And anything that, you know, any municipality is going to do, you need to go talk to your attorneys. They'll have their own uh, opinions, I'm sure. And I've already talked to enough attorneys to know that nobody agrees anyway. So I'll just tell you, you know, this is what we think the situation is. We think the situation is the FCC acted this past February to overturn House Bill 129. It's currently preempted from a very technical perspective. We and you and anybody else can go out and do basically what you want to do today. There is risk associated with that because the state attorney general in North Carolina and Tennessee have filed suit basically saying the FCC, you don't have the right to overturn a state law. And that's currently playing out. It's being briefed right now, but we'll probably get on for years. Probably end up in front of the Supreme Court. That's the one thing most uh, attorneys do seem to agree on, because they all think that's where this thing is headed. So that's the situation. What does it mean? It means that we are probably going to do some expansion. When we do some expansion, we're going to look at it in terms of what's our investment, what's our risk. So if we have fiber all the way to uh, the boundary, between Wilson and Nash counties. Wilson County is our authorized service territory under the previous legislation. And we can run a drop right off the end, get pick up a commercial account that has no service otherwise. That probably makes sense. It's not a huge amount of potential stranded investment. It's something that we can do and probably make our money back, return on that investment before anything is even decided uh, in the court system. Conversely, if we were talking about going out and overbuilding an entire other community and say, hey, Wilson, can you please bring fiber to my community? Probably not, uh, or possibly not, I guess is probably what I should say. Because that's a whole different investment model. The return is different, there's going to be more potential. Uh, if the FCC is ultimately unsuccessful uh, in this endeavor, and we had, or you had, or anyone had gone out and hook someone up to the network, we don't know what that would mean. You know, it could mean that for Wilson we just flat lose our exemption. Um, it could mean for Wilson that we have to disconnect that customer within 30 days, or there's a window of time that's in the legislation that we potentially have to disconnect and roll back the service. Or it could mean that potentially they could be grandfathered. So that's a whole lot of talking to say nobody really knows right now where this is all going to end up. Uh, the other thing before we get into the slide that I should talk about is we are one very specific model for bringing broadband infrastructure to our community. So we are very much the independent owner, operator, provider. So we built it, we went out and took out that, built the network, offer services directly to our citizens. That is not the only model out there. There are other models in North Carolina. Uh, how many of you know about the announcement this past Thursday night in Holly Springs? Okay, so their model is gonna be more of a public-private partnership. 
So they've gone in and built a back ring to interconnect city facilities. When they built it, they designed it, scaled it, sized it, so it could provide the back home for a fiber to the home service. And they've been very fortunate in finding a real private sector partner who will come in and work with them. They're gonna be leasing strands on the back home from Holly Springs, and then they're gonna go out and build the rest of the distribution network to connect the homes. All right, so that's one model. Another model is Columbia River EMC. Uh, that was a stimulus-funded project. They built property to the home down there, and they're actually doing an open access network where they build it and they kind of you know, put out the shingle and say, hey, anybody that wants to come provide services across this network, please come do so. That's another potential model. Village of Baldhead Island is also uh, in the process of trying to figure out what they're doing. Um, I'm not sure that we know what that model is going to be yet, uh, but I know they do have a bond referendum on the ballot for this coming November. So there's a lot of stuff going on. The rest of what I'll talk about is really what we've got going on and what we've seen in Wilson. But you know, those are some things I think everybody should be aware of when we're talking about fiber to the home in the municipality of North Carolina. Any questions before we go any further? So the demographics, the background, as I've already said, we're community owned and operated. We've been operating since 2008. Um, we're full triple play, you know, cable, internet, telephone services, 500 miles of cable. Uh, we now have about 7,800 subscribers. That represents now about 35% of our marketplace. I always have to say that that's a very misleading number. What you actually find is that we have neighborhoods where we're about 65 to 70% of the neighborhood and neighborhoods where we're about five or ten percent and that is driven by really income um, so the demographics of the community is what really drives the penetration rate more than anything else you know, our services absolutely run the gamut so all of our major employers utilize our network uh, we provide services to all the county schools uh, small businesses residents so really every type of customer that we have in the community we're servicing them with the network Why did we build Greenlight? Um, frankly, Wilson has a long history of investing in public infrastructure. Our council, I mean, since the 1800s, has been in the business of investing in public infrastructure to support the growth of our community. Our electric distribution system uh, is a great example of that. You know, back in the late 1800s, Wilson was an agricultural market town. Uh, as the market grew, they needed to have an auction place. So more people would come and sell tobacco. What do you need downtown in order to support the market? You need street lights. You know, so those types of thought processes have been in our community forever. You can also see it in our uh, reservoir. Back in the early 90s, building Buckhorn Reservoir, one of the largest reservoirs in the state, allowed us to have one of the most plentiful water supply in the state. And so from our elected officials' perspective, broadband was just a logical extension of that philosophy of investing in public infrastructure to support the private sector. And I think that's really key to you know, our community and our leadership view it as a, a partnership where we provide infrastructure that helps the private sector to grow in our community. We are given three missions by our council. So everything we do has to be judged through these lenses. The first is support the economic health of the community our primary focus. The second is to enhance the quality of life for our citizens and then finally to improve the delivery of other city services. I always think of that it's like the old commercial I think it was BASF you know we don't make the products you buy we make the products you buy but better that's kind of how it is with fiber in a municipality you know we're supporting much like IT supports all these underlying things or other things that the municipality does. So is it working? I'll give you some anecdotal evidence that would suggest that it is. You know, one of our favorite stories is a company called Exodus FX. Have any of you guys heard about this before? You hadn't done one of our presentations, that's good. This won't be boring, too boring. Um, so Exodus FX is a digital effects company that does work for Hollywood. They have worked uh, on Captain America, Black Swan, The Avengers, 
movie franchise uh, that does work on Game of Thrones. So very you know, high-end production, and they're doing digital effects. They originally were founded in LA. They wanted to move back to the East Coast, have to be located here. As everybody knows, the movie industry you know, has moved more and more into the southeastern United States. Uh, and they were looking around for a place to locate their business. The number one requirement was broadband access. And this is something that's really important. It's not just broadband speed, you know, especially not just download speed, it's upload. Upload is essential for these folks because they are altering content. They are sharing huge amounts of data back to their clients. So they needed a robust network that had high capacity uploads in order to facilitate the business model. So this company, a uh, digital effects company founded in LA, chose Wilson. They just found us on the internet and decided we we're going to move our business to Wilson because of the infrastructure that's there. We also have so in that case, that's an example of the community network drawing business specifically because of the technology. Another example is a company called Regency Interactive, their internet uh, marketing firm. They were located and founded in an adjacent community. They moved to Wilson because the reliability of services that they were receiving in the other community was not sufficient for them to continue to operate their business. They were having too many problems. They weren't being resolved quickly enough. They didn't have inroads into the service provider. I mean, I think we've all had that experience at some point where services are not working and it's difficult to get the, the issue fixed. It's difficult to find ways into the organization to get it escalated. So one of the benefits of the community network is the guy that owns that company, he knows me and he knows the city manager, he knows the mayor. We don't have a problem. We're not gonna let there be a problem. But if there is a problem, he has quick access to go in and get it fixed. And so that local priority of service was important in him moving his business. <coughs> One other example of uh, bringing new businesses to Wilson, uh, Carolina Breast Imaging was a uh, company, or is a company. They have facilities in eastern North Carolina based out of Greenville. They were looking for their next site to expand to. They came, they found out about our network, and they told us explicitly they chose Wilson because the infrastructure there supported their business model of transferring these medical records, these files, these images back and forth very efficiently. So, and this was actually the first 3D mammography uh, center in Wilson, and they came, so it's new technology coming to the community specifically because we had the network. They, they, the doctors told us when they had their grand opening, yeah, we decided on this location because of that. So those specific examples. As I already said, all of our major employers utilize the Fiber to the Home Network. Um, and it's important to point out, they use our service and they use everybody else's service too. When you're talking about these big operations, they're not just going to have one provider, they're going to have multiple providers. And what we've seen is, back in 2010, Donald, I think when the tornado came through, so the providers, or the major employers here, thought they had <coughs> circuit diversity before a tornado came through in 2010. They had multiple providers delivering service to their plant facilities. The tornado comes through town, tears up one intersection. All the pharmaceutical plants are without services. How is this? We have multiple providers. Well, in a lot of communities, there's only one network, really. There's the phone company's network. Those multiple providers are all riding across the phone company's network. So unless they've done a really thoughtful job about how they're delivering those circuits, they probably don't have diversity. It's a painful lesson for some of our major employers. It was a bit of a boon to green light because then the few that hadn't got uh, our services all called us the next day and said, you know, can you guys come quick and put us off? And I think we actually late attempt drop at one of the facilities while the other provider was trying to restore their services and go ahead and get them up and running. Another benefit of the network for major employers, when we first launched Greenlight, there was no point of presence in Wilson. We had to secure a path out the Rocky Mountain and a path out to Greenville in order to purchase internet service that we could then resell in our community. Once we got up and running, we started growing, we started aggregating demand. And so these providers who we were purchasing the bandwidth from saw, oh, Wilson is a growth market now. There's more opportunity here. And that has led two different tier one providers to come and invest in our head end, where we are now points of presence. We have points of presence in our facility 
for these providers. And what that's done is it's driven the cost of bandwidth in Wilson down. So every time we need to upgrade our circuits, our price per meg is going down. We've been able to take that savings and pass it on to the customer so that what we're doing is upgrading bandwidth. Whenever we realize the savings as far as our cost of goods sold, we go and give every customer more bandwidth. So I think we started out with a 10 by 10 as the base offering. We're now 50 by 50. We've done that two or three times. The other benefit is if you have major employers or major uh, facilities that need to have long haul, like Metro Ethernet circuits, it also drives those costs down. As the point of presence is in our community, it actually reduces the transport costs they're having to pay, and it you know, makes it a more attractive environment for them to do business. At another manufacturing facility, you know, we have several employees, as you might imagine, that came to us from the phone company. And they had been working for I guess more than a decade trying to figure out a cost effective means of getting a metro Ethernet circuit from Wilson to a place up in Pennsylvania and they could never get it in budget. They could never find a solution that would work as far as what they could afford to pay um, for the circuit. When we turned up the point of presence, automatically the price went down and they were able to go and secure the circuit. Now a couple of Weeks ago, I think I saw a disconnect order come across for that circuit and I thought, oh, this is terrible. What's going on? Why would they disconnect the circuit? I called up the customer and said, you know, well, why are you guys doing this? He said, oh, we decided to locate all that gear in Wilson now. So I don't know that that decision to locate all that infrastructure in Wilson was because of the network, but I can assure you it didn't hurt. Another good story about how we're supporting the economic health of the community. Our small businesses uh, certainly utilize the network. They do like the local service. They do like the more cost-effective services. Uh, but specifically, there is a, from what was a wireless internet service provider in Wilson, a company called Computer Central. When we first decided we were going to build this network, they hated the idea. Came to council, very upset. Wilson, you should not be getting into this business. You should not be competing with us. You're going to drive us out of business. You're going to hurt our ability to continue to operate. Fast forward a couple of years, they realized that the network actually created an opportunity for them to provide new services. They have totally moved away from the WISP model, except in some of the very rural areas at the end of our network. They went to all their commercial customers and said, you guys need to move over to Greenlight, get your services from Greenlight, and we're just going to do managed services. And so they have, I think, more than tripled their revenue. Um, by moving away from being a WISP and moving into managed services and cloud services for the business community in Wilson. So this is a private business in Wilson, originally was fully against it. They are now the chief proponent of our expansion. They call all the time, when are you building further? Because as we expand the network, we expand their market potential. Because the service is available in the areas right around Wilson where they have existing clients, network services currently available are not sufficient for their managed services to perform effectively. So now, you know, the biggest problem we've got is explaining to the people at Computer Central and their client base why we're not moving more quickly to expand. Another part of growing the economy of Wilson is it deep working with education, you know, trying to help encourage new endeavors that expose technology to folks in our community. Part of that is a partnership we have with the arts. Uh, we're working with Imagination Station, the Science Museum downtown, we're providing uh, internet into their facility, we provide internet into the Boykin Cultural, uh, Cultural Center uh, facility. We're also providing internet service uh, to the Restoration Center for our Whirly <coughs> Park. How many of y'all know what a Whirly Gig is? Wilson, i got to tell you about that. So there's a folk artist, guy named Wallace Simpson, who's world-renowned for creating Whirly Gigs. He had a, a field out in the middle of the county where he built all these elaborate windmill structures. And somebody discovered them, basically, or discovered him and realized this was hard. And they're actually quite valuable. <coughs> so we're now in the process of moving all those whirly goods from where they were down, down into downtown Wilson, restoring them to their original condition and creating a park. 
There's a lot of restoration work going on, and that's happening with professionals all across the world. I didn't even realize the value the network was bringing until one day I was in the workshop. And they talked about they're taking all these very high resolution digital images and sending them to experts all over the country. And the guy who was the local leader of the project said, you know, it's so nice to work here because it, it's more efficient. We're able to more quickly share data back and forth working with our various uh, partners to help us with restoration, again, because of the upload. Getting into quality of life, um, part of what we're doing is obviously we're expanding uh, Wi-Fi access throughout the community. Uh, we have just completed a Wi-Fi bill where we made service available across the entire fairgrounds. Uh, we've built it for Barton College, across uh, an umbrella across their campus. It's a small private college in our community. Obviously, we have downtown wireless. Uh, we built at Clinton Stadium, which is our coastal plane leads. Baseball team plays there, and also the Amtrak station. So part of this you know, improving quality of life, <coughs> bringing more services to folks, and strategically placing some of those too, not just in public spaces, but I think the next slide. Talks about digital quality. So you know it's great that we're talking about bringing this infrastructure to our citizens and to our businesses. Uh, but that's only one part of it. Having access is only one part of the equation. So if everyone in here is familiar with the digital divide, I would say. And think about this. When you talk about Google Fiber, and you talk about Team now in Holly Springs, and you talk about uh, Wilson and Salisbury and communities that do have it, it's fantastic that we as communities have access to this level of infrastructure. But we have an existing issue in our society, which is differential access to technology, you know, already for a variety of reasons. Some of it's economic, some of it's access to infrastructure, some of it's education and training. As these networks begin to be built, the digital divide is probably going to worsen because you're going to have communities with access to networks next generation network communities that do not have access to next generation networks. And even more problematic potentially with some of the models that are out there, you're going to have neighborhoods in one community where certain neighborhoods have access to the infrastructure and the other do not. And I think this is an important technology policy issue that people should be aware of. I'm not sitting here saying that the solution to the problems for everyone to go out and build a network just like Wilson did. But I think it is something that every community needs to be aware of. You know, if you start looking at lack of access to this infrastructure and how that's going to prevent people from being able to take advantage of services and participate in a creative class economy, it's something that from a policy perspective every community should at least be talking about. Our response to that has been we are looking to partner with every single community agency that we can that does any type of educational program. So we are providing free internet access into all the computer labs at our housing authority, the libraries. Uh, there's a place called SPOT, which is a nonprofit after school program for children. So what we're doing is we're bringing the infrastructure at no cost into these after school programs, anybody that's in any type of education. And then our staff, purely voluntarily, is going in and is volunteering providing services in those classrooms. So for example, a couple of months ago, we had um, some surplus equipment, we donated it to one of these agencies. Then our staff went out on the weekend and totally formatted everything, cleaned it up, got antivirus running on it, set up the computer lab for folks. Yeah. And it's something we can't necessarily single-handedly address the issue, but we can be out there being engaged in the community and helping to bring folks along. And one thing that I have heard said a lot about this digital divide issue is it's a matter of partially of education and relevance and showing people that they have I that why broadband access matters to them. I can tell you that's not been our experience. 
And most of, it's not about a lack of understanding, a lack of education. When you bring the services into the communities, you know, folks immediately take advantage of it. And, and basically run rings around what we think they're going to do with the services in these programs. It's a matter of getting access to them. Anybody have any questions? I said at the beginning we want to have a discussion. I'm still just up here talking away. A couple questions on your uh, digital products. Uh, yeah. How do you balance between providing free services for economic development um, and still maintaining a uh, business that's profitable? Right. Well, I mean, it's just a matter of or of I. So I have the job I have. As it turns out, I'm a GI scout by training. And it turns out I have a knack for managing revenue versus expense. So you know you just have to look at allocating, you know, a certain amount. You look at your business plan for a year, and you can determine what can we invest back into the community. Now there's another aspect of it that's very specific to us too: marketing for a community-owned fiber through the home network is not what you think. And we had to learn that lesson once we got started. Because we started out, we had postcards and billboards and flyers, and it had pricing, and you know, it was a total waste, frankly. Now what we understand is our marketing dollars all go into community reinvestment. You know? And so part of it is understanding that as a community-owned service provider, we're going to take those dollars that in most business plans would be for all those traditional marketing things, and we're going to use that to help bridge the digital divide. And it's a far more effective marketing strategy um, you know, because the word of mouth and the goodwill generated by doing what we should be doing which is not necessarily sending out postcards, but rather bringing services into these types of communities, you know, that helps grow the network, certainly. So we've talked about that. I'm, I'm from Salisbury. Um, so we talked about that, and city councils kind of said, well, we want to go out into our uh, different parks and rec areas, which just so happen to be in the uh, not so fortunate parts of town. Absolutely. And you get a bunch of feather trouble because these people that live in the country club have to pay for their services, but we're talking about offering free Wi-Fi at the, you know, the Parks and Rec centers and things like that. Is that anything you've dealt with? Yeah, we have not dealt with anyone getting their feathers ruffled at all. <laughs> um, you know, I think to the extent that there's maybe conversation, I mean, these are public spaces, you know, and they, well, public spaces is where we're going in and putting the wireless. When we run, uh, Fiber to some type of nonprofit educational institution, um, there's a clear understanding that that's simply our policy. And you know, we don't discriminate at all. Anybody, anywhere that's doing educational programming for kids, they're going to get fiber. You know? And since it's universally, that's our policy, that hasn't been an issue. Okay. What about um, your wireless in your downtown areas? Does that take away from your small business sales? No. Um, not been our experience. You know, we have to explain things to people sometimes. You know, um, yeah, it doesn't work inside your business because it's not going to. You know, you might get a little bit of signal, but that's not what we designed this for. Quite frankly, we designed it to not work in your business. <laughs> you know, um, which is only logical. So, other questions? Keep them coming, please. Um, I've got, and this might be a little bit too in the weeds um, for the session, but. We tried to pull some fiber from one side of the road to another mm -hmm. and got stuck in about a three month uh, battle with permits and DMT and all that stuff. And I'm just wondering, you know, if you guys run into any of that? Or, oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, when you're talking about building a fiber network, I think the biggest thing that people don't understand is that that's going to be probably your greatest challenge. Physical construction is easy. If you own the bulbs, which we do in the majority of circumstances we deal with it's not a big deal but you know people get in a trap where they'll go and say what's the cost per foot on that you know on average to build this and then they'll scope a project that way and they'll get started with it and they run out of money it's because it was five thousand dollars a pull for make ready, ready costs and they hadn't even thought about that Ted that's a really good point and one of the things that I, I had a meeting um, maybe a couple weeks ago with 
somebody from the Office of Digital Infrastructure, which used to be the ENC authority, and then it became NC Broadband, and blah, 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 blah. But now that they've centralized up underneath ITS and reporting to the new de Department of IT, do it, or DIT, or whatever they're calling themselves, um, I think DIT is what they're probably calling it. But there, there's this effort that we're trying to work on right now to, to gather that kind of information. So we probably will be sending out a survey so that people like you or Will or Dale can actually articulate what those challenges have been. Because now the state CIO has some level of authority over DOT, whereas before he has not had that, or if it's ever she, it would not have had that. So that's an area where I think the policy change that has given the state CIO all authority over from an IT standpoint may actually help local governments with negotiating more effectively with DOT because everybody that I've talked to, including I don't know if Raleigh's solved their challenges with DOT or not, but it is, there's a lot of fake rules that people have set up that are not actually real rules that have to be followed. And you know, one of the biggest impediments on any type of infrastructure, if you look at the pole lines, you know, typically speaking, in the communication space, a lot of times it runs into a situation where there's not enough room in the communication space for you to put. There's room, but because of where the lines are positioned, the other providers need to move up the pole to create room for whoever's coming in and put the infrastructure in. And that's all you. So what you know, Duke Progress is going to say is, hey, Wilson, call Time Warner and call CenturyLink or hey, Jacksonville or whoever and tell them they need to go move their infrastructure. And that goes really well. <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, do you guys mind helping us out? Um, and I should say, in Wilson, we have a great relationship, actually, with the other folks that operate, um, specifically in our community. But we've done a bunch of work for other communities, and it's a big challenge. So, internal communications. Um, this should be self-evident to everyone in this room. We've got 35 occupied facilities that the city of Wilson operates in. We have hundreds of non-occupied facilities and infrastructure locations. Uh, in the past, we paid for services to all of them. Now we use our fiber network uh, to provide all of those services. That was a big part of the original justification for building the back home. Um, and that has allowed us to do you know, more things for the organization. For example, um, we're providing mobile surveillance throughout the community in partnership with the PD. That's something that they like a lot because of how responsive we're able to be. They can say, we need a camera at this location this afternoon. By and large, we're able to go out and get a camera at that location this afternoon. We also have a mobile emergency command trailer. So anytime there's a major incident in the community, we pull the uh, trailer out. We've got pre-identified splice points. And we've got the trailer already set up with ONT. So we just go jack the trailer straight into the fiber network, wherever it is, giving them access to you know, gigabit service, whatever resources they need out in the middle. Uh, we're also providing uh, surveillance services. Wilson Police Department provides uh, contract security for the college and town. So we're able to use the fiber network to remotely monitor the surveillance cameras and fire alarms, all the facilities there at the college, providing that service across the network. What do you guys draw power for? Um, off the meter power, typically. So there's going to be a meter, because we have to meter the power we consume for our ONT. So we have a meter collar that goes behind the glass of the meter to UPS, and then from that we can power the ONT in the camera. Okay. Did I get that right? All right. Have a good day. <laughs> Easier to keep it straight when it's like a question. Uh, we're also in the middle of a major AMI deployment, and this is something we really want to talk about how we're going to bring broadband to North Carolina, this is a big deal right here, because folks are going to be deploying AMI infrastructure for a certainty universally across the state, let's say the next 10 years, if not sooner. This is where things are heading in the utility industry. And when you do that, you're going to have to have backhaul. And there are some options out there for wireless backhaul. But even then, you're probably going to be driving fiber deeper and deeper into it's something that's going to happen. And as you're doing that, you need to be thinking about whoever the, the electric provider is in the community. If you're interested in having a conversation about how we improve infrastructure, 
get to know the power company, get to know what they're doing about AMI, figure out what technologies they're using, and see how you might be able to leverage that to start driving these services into the community. You know, there is a great business model around the overlapping benefits of AMI and for all payment. We're also using the network for distribution automation, which is something that I just think is cool. We totally stole this from Chattanooga because this is kind of how Chattanooga originally communicated about why they were building their fiber network. But you take all the reclosures, which all the switch gear out from the electric distribution gear grid, then you connect that into the fiber network, and then they are really smart switches. They talk to each other. So if there's a power of fault on the grid, they dynamically reroute power to minimize the numbers of customers that are down and keep up. Uh, the restoration time is minimal as possible. Um, and it's something that is very useful. We've seen it work. It works well. And it's something that customers can understand and appreciate. It's a benefit that they're seeing out of the network when you explain it to them. And also, it's just kind of cool. Because we're deploying all of this infrastructure, we now have a much denser array of sensors across the community. The sensors, obviously, we've already talked about cameras, but from an outage management perspective, the ONTs are talking to us. So the fiber terminals at the end are talking to us all the time. Smart meters are talking to us all the time. The wireless access points are talking to us all the time. So we have this much greater you know, level of intelligence about what's going on across the community at time, and that's all coming back across the fiber network into our UFI communication center, which is this. Uh, again, one of the cooler parts of my job, in addition to internal IT services and broadband network, um, we are responsible for what's called the Unified Communication Center. That's all non-public safety dispatch for the city of Wilson. So it's kind of like a 311 center, but we don't use a 311 number yet. Um, but if you think about this as being the brain and the fiber network being sort of the nervous system stretching out across the community, and it's pulling back all these various data feeds from all the sensors that we're deploying throughout the community and it's from staff you know, 24 7 365 and what it's allowing us to do now is to be far more proactive in the way we're servicing our customers and it's had a very significant positive impact on the perception the community has about our organization the level of service we provide uh, you know, many many times now we'll actually be dispatching proactively before we get the call and we've had situations where somebody's been on the phone trying to report a problem, and because we had a crew in the area, you know, I see that we, you know, we saw you had a problem. And one of my favorite stories you may have heard in any of these presentations, we had a new customer on the Greenlight Network several years ago now who had just had services installed the day before, and we monitored particularly closely any new installations. You know, for a period of time after the installation to make sure there's not any issues for a new customer. And one of our TSRs in the communication center saw that the OMT had gone offline, looked at the map, saw the AVL, and was like, well, there's a supervisor around the corner. Let me go ahead and send uh, the technician by to see what's going on. He knocks on the door, lady answers, she's on the phone. Turns out she was on the phone with her husband. She hadn't even called us yet. She was just calling her husband to tell her husband the internet service had stopped working. And uh, so she's on the phone and goes, oh, well, they're already here. And uh, hung up and fixed the problem. A couple of weeks later, I was in a meeting with the school superintendent. So it turns out that was his house. And my boss, the boss was in the meeting, and he told that story. It was just, you know. <laughs> And the next thing to talk about with this one, and this is kind of in the DNA, I think, of municipalities, so it's somewhat self-evident. But if you're thinking about power to the home for us, you always have to touch on the fact that customer care is essential. You know, we live in this community. You know, and caring about people was something that we talk about literally all the time in our operation. You know, what's our job? To care about people. You know, our job is to take care of people. Everything else is a byproduct of taking care of people. And you know, the fiber network is a byproduct of taking care of people. And when you look at our mission, I think we're able to successfully accomplish the mission because we understand, I believe at every level of the organization, 
profession, that we just come to work every day and we take care of people. Um, and I believe that that has been the greatest contributor to whatever success we have had with Greenland. So that is the standard Wilson slide deck. I also have some more slides that are more technical. I'm hoping at this point there's more questions. We can open up to uh, a discussion. Let me ask you a question. Anybody want to tell me why you came to the session? Several of the universities, MIT University, UCG. I think Elon will probably get involved as well. But uh, we're still in the process of completing it or writing the RFP. Having a little bit of issue, we had invited the uh, uh, some of the folks from Raleigh to come down and talk with us. And I think it was one of the legal counsel members from the Attorney General that, that had actually come down. And there was questions still regarding what you had talked about. It's kind of up in the air, so a little bit of apprehension right there. You're talking about the FCC preemption? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I believe that actually... The Attorney General's office that it, it was, filed the lawsuit? No, no, it was actually the Greensboro, the Greensboro uh, attorney. attorney. Yeah. I'm not surprised by that. Uh, I, I really couldn't shed any light on that because I said at the beginning of this very unclear. I have a, what are you charging for one gig connection? Ninety nine ninety five. Okay. So <laughs> that's I, I heard some other communities, I think uh, St. Louis, I think they were charging like seventy some bucks for a gig, so that's, that's pretty good. Uh, I think the, the going rate is between sixty nine ninety five and ninety nine ninety five for a good and we're on the upward end of that. Um, well, I don't think it's terribly unreasonable for that level of service. Is that for home users or residential as well as business? Or is uh, no, that is not for business. Um, which is an interesting point there, is that quite frankly, it probably will be for business. And many of the providers that have uh, launched later than we did have understood that. Um, and it's something that I would recommend. Um, when you have a fire too, the pricing models that are out there today, when you look at sort of the legacy pricing models from the various vendors, they're built on an old understanding, which was a scarcity, scarcity based understanding, right? So it's this finite resource. It's going to cost us a bunch to provide the service. When you put in a fiber network, it's not really as true as it once was. You know? So at a certain level, I think you can see the market across the board evolve as the infrastructure the market will evolve and those commercial offerings that everybody's familiar with are going to continue to come down and down and down. Uh, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect of it is because when businesses tend to be highest users and when residents tend to be highest users, they don't conflict with each other. So you actually can create you know, an opportunity to sell more because these two different user bases are working at different times. Is there any difference between the service you're offering for residential versus business? I mean, you know, like, are you offering any service level agreements? Yeah, so we do offer service level agreements for you know people that want them. So you know, we're providing uh, services to a major banking operation Wilson that has multiple locations, uh, and you know we've been providing that ever since. They were our first customer on the network. We have an SLA on those uh, circuits. You know, and there is theoretically a technical difference between our residential and commercial offerings um, in that we do apply QoS to guarantee a higher level of service to the commercial uh, customer. In practice, because of the way we build our network, frankly, we don't need QoS. I mean, everybody's getting what they're getting. 
you know. Um, but in the event, because one of the things is over time, as this capacity for utilization grows, you've got to upgrade capacity. You could get into situations for a short period of time while you're making your upgrades where you may actually have a little bit of you know, lack of performance. And in that case, you do want to make sure that the commercial customer is getting a little bit higher. They're paying a little bit. Are you finding that fiber over time, the grade is getting more Places. I mean, recently, I've just got people saying 20 years, 25 years. So I think the 20 and 25 year mark is about depreciation, and it has nothing to do with the physical asset, um, which is a big issue if you want to talk about that. Um, maybe offline, depreciation of fiber and plants is an interesting topic. Uh, you know, it's certainly got to do with you know, the vendor and the quality and all those different things. But at the end of the day, we don't really know what useful life is. I mean, I work with someone who has personally put fiber cable in that's still working today. And it was 40 years ago when it was put in, you know. Um, so I would say that 20 years is an absolute minimal useful life of fiber on the cable. Other questions? So it's a, what's called an ONT, the optical network terminal. Uh, where basically, the fiber connects into the ONT, and then it's got uh, RF uh, data and uh, POTS ports out, so it does the conversion there, and we can use the existing wiring that's already in the house for the most part. Okay, but no other equipment, I mean, other than just the... You know, no, well, we will install a, a little hard wire router just as a gateway, a manageable gateway on the far side of the the ONT, um, and that's more for troubleshooting purposes than anything else, and they're cheap. And the value it provides to us in troubleshooting is it warrants the investment. And you can always opt to run a wireless router. You have a question? Yeah, did you have a particular demand requirements for your last mile connections, or just build the entire network out? So we were mandated to build the entire city of Wilton. So there was no demand requirement whatsoever. Council stated we are going to build past every address in our community. As we now are in an expansion phase, it is demand driven. You know, so we look at the demand in the community. I mean, basically, we know what we want our ROI to be as we're doing these expansions, and so we'll look at you know the cost, passings, and demand based on what the customers tell us, and then we'll say yes or no. And how did you prioritize where you went first? Um, so basically, it's at this point, and you're talking about originally when we built in the community? Yeah, your original build out. Yeah, so we started the center and work out, you know, because to be equitable, that was about the best thing we could come up with is we're going to start right here and work in both directions, moving across the community. Did you, uh, did you incorporate your like, public utilities facilities to do this stuff, or did you, did you hire third party companies to come in and play this The original backbone was built exclusively by our utility crews. When we made the leap of going from the back home to actually build the distribution plant, we had an army, a legion of contractors who came into the community and descended upon them and built it out. Uh, over in Korea, 
the government over there kind of works more like a small community government with, with these types of the telephone calls, national, uh, basically the transportation of everybody. You know, I don't know if anything like it could ever work in America or anything. It is interesting to see those types of communities, that's not okay, but transportation and the infrastructure over there is incredible. You ever get a chance to visit that? Uh, you know, I think it's a great example, but, you know, we are competing globally when you talk about infrastructure. Um, and so there's a lot of levels of competition. Like, Wilson's competing with Raleigh. You know, we have to be a desirable place for people to come and live. You know, uh, which means that if there's infrastructure there, then we need to have a different level of infrastructure in our community. But then we as a state are competing with places like Korea. And it's very unfortunate that this issue of broadband um, has kind of gone where it's gone. Because at the end of the day, I think this is about infrastructure. And our model is not right for most communities. I think that's pretty fair to say. Um, but if you as a community are not proactively engaged in this discussion, you're missing the boat. And I, and I think that's the thing that is concerning to me, is there may be folks who are hesitant to engage in this discussion around broadband in the communities, because I mean, frankly, there have been so many attacks against those that have tried to engage in this issue. And that's a big problem, and it's something that we've got to overcome as municipalities and overcome as a state. Because if we're going to compete both individual communities and as a state, everybody's going to have to do something. Because Google Fiber will not solve this issue in our state. Municipalities will not solve this issue in our state. No one person is going to bring the infrastructure across, or one entity across this whole state. And because we are the people responsible for infrastructure in our communities as municipalities, have to be engaged in this. We don't have to build a network ourselves necessarily, although clearly I think we should be allowed to do so if that's what our elected leaders decide. But you know, we have to be engaged. And uh, I appreciate you guys being in this room because it's one thing I've seen is a lot of folks don't come to these sessions. And it is an important issue. Any other questions? I guess we'll be done a little bit early.